Hello, friends. We start out Mark chapter 1 today. A question. Would you rather go to a church with amazing miracles every week or with great teaching every week? And which one do you think Jesus is more likely to show up for? Now, remember, I'm tag teaming this study with Sandy Adams, so I'll pass the baton to Sandy in a couple minutes. But first, I want to stir up your thinking on this chapter. So this is my thought from Mark 1. Miracles or teaching? Which one would you prefer? We're going to see both of them here. Jesus was a miracle worker, and Jesus also came to preach. So which one was more important? And for you today, which one makes for a healthy church? Now, I know it doesn't have to be one or the other, but just think with me here on this one. Mark chapter 1 jumps in very quickly to the ministry of Jesus. In the first 13 verses, John the Baptist prepares the way. Jesus is baptized. The Father is pleased, and Satan tries to tempt Jesus in the desert. In verse 14, Jesus is ready to start ministry. And watch the words, the very first words here about Jesus' work. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Now this is important. Jesus was all about the message. The kingdom of God has come near. It's an invitation. God's kingdom has come to you. You don't have to go on a great journey or undertake mighty conquest to find it. You can join his kingdom right here. If you make God your king, you are part of God's kingdom. But what if you don't belong in God's kingdom? What if you're not good enough? Hey, that's the good news. Jesus can get us in. He came to us. He paid the full price of citizenship. That's why in verse 15, he says, Repent and believe the good news. Change your mind about sin and turn and follow Jesus. And speaking of follow, that's exactly what Jesus says to each of his new disciples. He starts with Simon and Andrew in verse 17. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. And they followed. Simon will later be called Peter, by the way. And then James and John do the same. They follow. No miracles recorded here yet, but look what Jesus does next. In verse 21, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Jesus is teaching. And there's a key word here about how Jesus taught. He taught with authority. Authority is a kind of power, but not just strength or energy. Authority is power with legitimacy and the right to exercise that power. And the people take note. One of those people is demon-possessed. Now, as you read, watch how the demons respond to Jesus. They know who he is, and they respond to his authority. And when Jesus casts out the demon in verse 27, the people were all so amazed that they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching? And with authority? He even gives orders to impure spirits, and they obey him. And all those amazed people started telling all the other people. In verse 28, the news spreads fast. Man, when people start bringing the sick and the possessed from all over, the whole town ends up crowded at Jesus' door. And he heals, and he casts out demons. But something curious, Jesus keeps telling the healed not to tell everyone else. And when Jesus heads out early in the morning to get some solitude, the disciples show up to tell him, Everyone is looking for you. But then in verse 38, Jesus replied, Let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. Now, did you catch that? Jesus came to preach. It's about the message. It's about the invitation to God's kingdom. And all the hype building up over miracles was getting in the way of the message. Jesus says, let's go where I can preach. That is the reason that I'm here. So then, why did he do the miracles? Well, for one, out of compassion, Jesus cared. But there's another reason. In the Bible, miracles are often called signs and wonders. Now, a wonder is something that makes you stop and think, as in, I wonder how on earth that happened. It gets your attention. And a sign is something that points or gives direction. A sign is not the main thing. Just like John the Baptist said, I'm not the main guy. The one who comes after me, he's the one. A sign points. Think about this. Say I'm driving to Disney World. On the side of the road, a billboard says, Disney World. 
and a big old Mickey glove points the way to the entrance. Now, if I pull the minivan over, jump out, and start climbing up that billboard with my kids in tow, you'd say, Chris, stop. That's a sign. The Magic Kingdom is over that way. You follow the sign. You don't climb all over it. Don't miss the point. Get it? Mickey is pointing. Don't miss the... Never mind. But the same truth applies to miracles. Watch how careful Jesus is with these miracles. He keeps telling people not to tell everyone about them. He doesn't want the miracles to become the main thing. They're pointing to something greater, to a kingdom, much better than Mickey's kingdom. Now, this is a great lesson for us starting out. We're going to read about a lot more miracles here in Mark, and you may see some in your own life, but don't camp on the miracle. Look for the sign. Where is it pointing you? What is it teaching you? In your life, in your church, keep your priorities straight. The supernatural stuff is awesome, but focus on the kingdom stuff. Love God, love your neighbor, and teach the word. And speaking of teaching, it's time for me to hand this over to our teacher. So here's Sandy Adams to round out our study in Mark chapter 1. The first chapter of Mark reels off events that take Matthew eight full chapters to cover. Mark pictures Jesus as the man on the move, but the man who never loses touch with his purpose and his priorities. Jesus' ministry is ramping up. He's kicking it into higher gear when in verse 33 we're told, the whole city was gathered together at the door. Imagine the whole city gathered on the front porch. Understand, Jesus' growing popularity created a serious problem with crowd control. Now, here's the picture of the Messiah that Mark reveals to us. His ministry is a whirlwind of activity, but that ministry always revolves around a calm and peaceful center. You see, see, Jesus got things done without becoming undone. And there were two reasons why. First, notice in chapter 1, verse 35, it says of Jesus, In the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. Jesus spent time with God on a regular basis. He rose early in the morning. He found him a quiet place, a private place to refuel his spiritual tank. He filled up in the morning and he ran off high octane fellowship the rest of the day. We run down, guys, because we don't fill up. Do you take some time? Do you rise early in the morning and set yourself apart to seek the Lord. We need to mimic Jesus. He got things done without becoming undone, and that's how. The second thing Jesus did, though, is he refused to let others dictate his schedule. Throughout the book of Mark, we see Jesus operating on his own timetable, according to his own plans. Divine priorities, not public pressure, guided Jesus. Rather than cater to the crowds, as we said, he tried to avoid them. And here are two lessons for us. Fill up every morning. Renew your fellowship with God. Then focus in on God's priorities for you. That's how you ensure that you won't fizzle out. Fill up, focus in, and you won't fizzle out. Thanks for joining us for today's quick audio guide. And remember, faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word.